Hello, my name is Carl Lloyd Hauser. I am the senior pastor of Grace Community Church, and I am so excited that you are with us on this podcast. We also want you to get connected in a church family. If you don't have a local church, check us out at gracemontrose.org. We want to make sure that you have an opportunity to grow and connect with God. But we pray that these next 25, 30 minutes that you spend with us are powerful, that God meets you and speaks to you because He loves you so much. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? All right. You know, it had been a long time since I'd been here, and now I've been here twice in a month. So it's great to be back with you guys already and get to see you again. So thank you guys for being here today. Uh, So I want to start off today with a passage of Scripture. Uh, If you have your Bible, you can flip over to the book of Philippians chapter 4. And in this book, uh, Paul is writing this letter to the church in Philippi, and he's kind of giving them some final instructions and exhortations and, you know, just trying to really leave them with some good information. And in Philippians 4.19, he says this, and this is a very often quoted verse, and I think it's something we might know pretty well. It says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his glory, or to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And so as we've been preparing for this sermon series, this extravagant sermon series, I started thinking about that. Isn't it great that God says that he is going to take care of us? Anybody glad that God's going to take care of us? That's a, that's a good thing, right? But as I was thinking about it, I thought sometimes maybe we have the wrong idea about what that looks like. You know, it wasn't really that long ago in our history as people that, uh, you know, you could take an entire family, all their earthly possessions, their five to seven children, and load them up in a single covered wagon and move them across the country, no problem. Nowadays, you couldn't move a family with one child across town without a semi-truck and a forklift and a team of highly skilled movers, simply because we have so much stuff now that it's hard to do. How many of you guys know we've got way too much stuff? Anybody have too much stuff? Yeah, you're pointing at your spouse, you're like, the other one's got too much stuff. It's not me, it's them, it's their stuff, right? Like, I, I, I really realized this not too long ago. I was, uh, uh, I live in a, you know, our house is like 3,000 square feet. It's got a big finished basement on it. And uh, I couldn't find anywhere to put new stuff because my old stuff, which was next to my broken stuff, which was in the way of the stuff that I'm going to fix someday, which is right next to the stuff that I may use and I may not use, uh, I couldn't find anywhere to put new stuff. And that's a problem. I sound like a hoarder. I know. I'm not actually, it's not actually that bad, right? It's all good stuff. It's all stuff I might need. And, uh, but that's the problem. It's just stuff. It's just stuff. In fact, how many of you guys here today have ever made a decision on what type of house you were going to buy based on how much of your stuff you could put in it. You don't need a one-car garage. You need three garages, right? And if that's not enough, then you need a shop and a shipping container and an entire rental yard to be able to put all your stuff in. And, you know, the only other option is, heaven forbid, we get rid of some stuff, which is not going to happen. We all know that. That's okay. So why are we talking about stuff? Why are we talking about that today? Well, in this series called Extravagant, we are looking at this idea of the extravagance of God. This is how I put it in Delta the other day, that God is so extra in a good way. God is so much beyond, so far above everything that we need and ask in this life. And if God is so extra, how does that apply to our lives? And, and, and I don't know about you, but I am glad that we serve a God who is not weak and beggarly and short on resources and power. We serve a God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine according to his glorious power that is at work within us. Amen. So as we take on this topic today that I want to talk about, uh, I just want us to get our mindset framed in the right way. Uh, Because today what I want to talk about is God's extravagant provision for our lives. But I don't want us to think for one moment that that provision is simply related to stuff. It's not just about stuff in our lives. It's not just, if we have the idea that God's faithfulness is somehow determined by some quantity of something that I have, then all we really have is the wrong idea about God's provision for our lives. Yes, it says God wants to supply our needs. Yes, it says God wants to take care of those things. We need a place to live. We need a car to drive. We need money to buy food. We need all those things. 
But if that's the limiting factor in our view of God's provision for our lives, then I think there might be some more that we're missing out on. Because while it does say in Philippians 4.19, God will supply those needs, never does it say this is just about stuff. Never does it make that, that, that it's just about the things that we have. In fact, if we back up just a couple of verses to Philippians chapter 4, and Paul gives a little context to this statement that he gives in verse 19, in verses 10 through 13. And he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly now that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I am spe- not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then he says that very familiar verse of Scripture, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So Paul makes it very clear, we're not talking about stuff. He says, I can have plenty or I can have nothing. That doesn't change the faithfulness of God. It's not about my material possessions. It's not about my comfort level. It's not about any of those things. It's actually about something much deeper than that. So when he says in verse 19, my God will supply all your needs, He's talking about something much deeper than material possessions. He's talking about something that goes far beyond stuff. And so that's the idea that I want to zero in on today. If God is going to supply our needs according to his glorious riches, what does that look like? If we can kind of zoom in on that idea, maybe we can get just a little bit better idea of what Philippians 4.19 is talking about. And it really comes down to this one question that I want us to think about over and over again throughout this service today. And that's simply this, is what do you need? I mean, what is it in this life that you truly need? It's not about what we want, but what do we really need? And I want us to flip over to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1. We're going to spend some time there today talking about this idea. So in 2 Peter, chapter 1, starting in verse 3, it says this. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire." For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ." So when you, could, when you put this passage of Scripture kind of up next to what we just read over in Philippians, we see that there is a great promise that God has given us, that God has already given us everything we need for life and godliness. I mean, think about how amazing that is. God is so extra. He is so extravagant in the way he wants to provide for his children. He has given us everything we already need for life and godliness. Can you think of anything in this world you need that doesn't fall into one of those two categories? Is there anything in this life that you could possibly need that would not fall into the category of life and godliness? All the necessities we need for our daily provision and everything we need to become more like Christ God has already given us. And so as we look into that, maybe maybe this is a better way of asking that question. Uh, Have you ever thought about filtering your decision-making based on maybe something like this? Uh, Have you ever thought about implementing a stuff I want versus stuff I need kind of a filter in your life? Because there's plenty of things we want. How many of you guys want something? Like, man, I, I could go for a donut right now. You know, like I want, do I need a donut? Obviously not. You know, there's, we, we, we've got that figured out. So 
What it's talking about, though, here in 2 Peter, and I love this because he's talking about this process of transformation, of how we kind of move through this step toward getting to this place where this becomes our filter. Because he says that as we grow in the knowledge of God, as God imparts his knowledge to us about his great and precious promises, it actually removes us from this place of desire and temptation that causes us to be seeking after simply what we want and instead helps us to focus on what we actually need. This is the process that the first couple verses right here in 2 Peter are talking about. This moving us to a place where we are evaluating. And it's when we get that mindset, when we begin to apply that, we start evaluating and asking ourselves this question, what do I really need? What is it that I need? Not, not what do we want, Because we know that what we want often just comes from selfish desire. I mean, think about that. There is so much pain and sin and hurt that has been inflicted upon our world simply because somebody wanted something. It wasn't something they needed. It wasn't something they had to have. It had nothing to do with life or godliness, but they wanted it for themselves. And so what did they do? They hurt somebody else to get it. There's so much pain that's caused by this problem right here. But as we become more like Christ, we learn to evaluate this question. What do I really need? I think such a big part of living in the kingdom of God is learning the difference between what I want and what I need. What do I want versus what do I need? In fact, I really want to help you today. You might not get anything else out of this service, but this this part right here could really help you. How many of you guys have conflict in your life? Does anybody have conflict? You're afraid to raise your hand because you're sitting next to the person that you have conflict with. And you know they're going to ask you later, well, who do you have conflict with? And you're like, nobody. I just raised my hand because he told me to. You have conflict. You have a conflict with your spouse. You have conflict with your children. You have conflict with your relatives. You have conflict with people at work or your neighbor. Where does that conflict come from? Most of the time, does it not come from a place where what I want and what they want don't seem to line up? What I want and what they want are at odds with one another, and so we have a conflict over this. Very, very rarely is what you need going to be at conflict with what somebody else needs. But when it's all about what we want, that's where we see problems. That's where we see conflict and strife. In fact, James talks about this. You can flip back a couple of books to the book of James chapter 4. Because James talks about this very thing. In James chapter 4, starting in verse 1, he says, What causes quarrels and causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So I'm telling you this today. If you want to get rid of the majority of conflict in your life, here's one easy step that you can take. Stop focusing on what you want all the time and start focusing on just what you need. Stop focusing on what you want because it's putting us at odds with other people and what they want. Instead, if we would focus on what we need, I believe that so much good could come from that. Myself included, if we would focus on uh, on what God wants to do in us and what we need to receive from him, I believe God will elevate our earthly nature to a place of divine nature where he's making us more like Christ and he's allowing us to look more like him. And in that process, we're going to see a transformation, a shift that moves away from simply living for what we want and moves us toward what we need. Because when we answer that question, when we know what that means, I believe life becomes so much better. So what if we did that? What if we made that switch? And as I was thinking about that, I wondered this. How many of us here today actually know what we need? Maybe we have spent a lifetime focusing on what we want, but we've never really stopped and said, 
What do I actually need? We've never really evaluated that question or put that filter in place and said, is this something I want or is this something that I need? And so I want to dive in back to 2 Peter chapter 1. And as we look at this, verse 5 kind of gives us some clues. How do we tap in? How do we begin to make that switch? And this is what it says. It says, for this very reason. So since we're working on this process and God's taking us from what we want to what we need, it says, for that very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Now, I want to stop right there for just a second. And I want to, I want to focus in on that. What if the very first thing that we need in this life beyond anything else, beyond any other uh, you know, need that we'll ever have, what if the very first thing that we need in this life is to reconcile that we need to put our faith in Jesus Christ? Because he says, add to your faith. So he is assuming that we're starting at this one common point. And he says, add to your faith virtue. So what if the first thing that we need is to accept for ourselves, to put our faith and our hope and our trust in the person of Jesus Christ, to accept that what he said he would do, he did, that he is who he says he is. What if that's the starting point of what we need? Because anything else based outside of that is always going to feel at conflict it's always going to feel like it's about what we want. In fact, it talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2. You can flip over there for just a second. Verses 1 through 5. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And he says, by grace you have been saved. So it's really talking about the same idea that when we are dead in our trespasses and sins, when we're living for our own desires and our own wants, it says that's going to leave us separated and isolated from God. But what if the very first thing that we needed to implement in our lives was simply to lay the foundation of faith? And so I want you to think about that over the next few minutes. We're going to circle back around to this, but maybe the reason why we struggle with selfishness and things like that is because we've never reconciled the truth that we need to make the switch to faith in Jesus Christ and allow him to change us to become more like himself. But moving on from there, assuming that we have laid the foundation of faith in Christ in our lives, we're at this same starting point that Peter is identifying right here. What do we need in our lives? What are God's great and precious promises that he has given us that pertain to all things concerning life and godliness. What does that look like today? And if you look at 1 Peter, it says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. This idea of virtue is the first thing that it says. And it says, uh, virtue is simply the idea of moral goodness or moral right standing. And so think about the implications of what this passage of Scripture is saying. God has already given you everything you need to have virtue in your life, to be able to come to a place of moral goodness. God has supplied that to you. That's an incredible promise. I don't think we grab a hold of that very often. And here's why I know that. Because if you're like me, you've probably struggled with this in your life before. You want to do what is right. You want to do what is godly. You want to do what is, uh, you know, according to scripture. But we've got problems. We have habits. We have sins. We have addictions. We have things that hold us back. And, and, and so what happens is so often we look at this and we think, I'm not attaining to this, this virtue, this moral goodness that God wants me to have. And we kind of give up very often. 
We kind of get tired of it. In, in, in fact, I would uh, reason to say that the majority of believers in Christ probably spend the majority of their life in Christ trying to get from faith to virtue. Trying to go from, okay, Jesus, I trust you. I've, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. And now I just need to act like you. Anybody ever been there before? And you're just still kind of caught in this, I want to do good, but I don't. And I want to, I want to you know, serve God, but then I, I mess up. And there's this tension that exists right here. But it shows us what we really need. And it says God has provided us everything that we need. And, and so often we're living in this place, trying to get to a place of moral goodness. And, and I see a fair amount of people simply give up at this process. Throw in the towel or settle for, well, this is good enough. I can't seem to get rid of this sin. I can't seem to get rid of this addiction. I can't seem to get rid of this character flaw. So I'm just going to settle right here in this kind of, uh, you know, in between of moral goodness and faith. And we never go beyond that. But the problem is, is that so often we are trying to overcome, we are trying to get better, we're trying to do better, but we're doing it in the wrong source. We're trying to do it from ourselves. We're trying to overcome our problems with our own strength and willpower. Anybody ever tried to do that before? I'm just going to muscle my way out of this sin. I'm just going to fight my way out of this. I'm going to read 47 Bible verses every morning and listen to 13 hours of worship music every single day. And, you know, I'm going to do all these things. I'm just going to fight my way out of sin. And God says, I've already given you everything you need. You don't have to do all that. What you need to tap into is my virtue. What you need to tap into is my supply, my provision, my source for your life, not your own strength. I don't know about you, but I am so guilty of doing that all the time that when I need something, I try to get it in my own strength. When I need something, I try to do it in my own intelligence or my own knowledge or my own virtue. And it always comes up short. And it's sad because God has, he is so extravagant. He is so abundant. He is so extra in a good way that he's already given us everything we need to be able to apply this to our lives. And yet I'm stuck trying to do it in my own strength. So when it comes to virtue, when it comes to knowledge, when it comes to steadfastness and godliness and brotherly affection and love, when it comes to these things that God says, this is what you need in your life, we have to understand God is the source that we're looking to. God is so abundant and so extravagant and so extra in all of these things. And yet he is so wonderful to us that he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. It's already there. It's already been applied to us. And so again, I want to ask you today, what do you need in your life? Some of us here today, we might need some virtue. We might need some moral goodness to overcome some sinful habits, some character flaws, some addictions, some things like that. We may need that in our lives, but the thing we have to remember is that it's not our virtue we're trying to apply here. It's His. It's not our virtue we're trying to attain to. It's his. When we look at the life of Jesus Christ, when we look at the way that he lived, the way that he interacted with people, the way that he spoke, the way that he did things, that's the virtue of God being lived out for us. And God says we can be like Christ, becoming more like him. That's applying that virtue to our lives. So it's not in ourselves and in our own strength. But it's actually in God's provision that he has given us. So as we tap into his virtue, it says the next thing that we need. It says make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. But then he goes on from there. And so you can apply this to all of these things in this list. He says, and add to your virtue knowledge. How many of you guys understand this, that we do not possess the quantity of knowledge that we need to be able to be successful in this life? Does anybody come to that point where maybe, maybe it's as you get older. You know, when I was 20-something, I was like, I'm pretty smart. 
I'm 40 something now. I'm like, I am the dumbest human on the face of the earth. What has happened to me? Like, where did all that knowledge go? Apparently it was just confidence, not actual knowledge. And so, uh, so we have to understand that what we need comes from God. And I think about this, like my knowledge is insufficient, but God's knowledge is not. His provision in this area is so far above mine. That's why it says in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. He's, he's identifying that there is this massive gap between how I think and how he thinks, what I know and what he knows, how he does things and how I do things. But he says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So that's a pretty incredible truth, but God has already given us everything we need for life and godliness. So those thoughts that are so much higher than my thoughts, those ways that are so much higher than my ways are available to me if I tap into God's knowledge and not my own. Let me give you just a really simple example of kind of how I've seen this play out in my life. A few years ago, as I recognized that my children were getting older and they were going to be leaving the house soon, uh, we have a pretty big yard, so I broke down and I bought a riding lawnmower. It was a used riding lawnmower uh, because, you know, I'm cheap, but I'm not dumb. And so I decided that, you know, I'm not going to push mow this lawn anymore. I can send them out to do it, but I, I'm not going to do that myself. So I bought this riding lawnmower. And uh, it worked good for the first couple of weeks, and then for some reason, I just couldn't get it to start one day. And so I didn't think much about it. I just kind of left it. The grass is starting to get, you know, kind of grow out of control. And, and, uh, and I couldn't figure out what's wrong with it. So I, I'm, you know, I, I'm wise, but I'm also cheap. And so I, I got all my tools out and I said, I'm going to go out there. And I'm going to fix this thing, right? I'm not a mechanic. I don't claim to be a mechanic. Uh, and so, but I've got tools, you know, I, I've got that going for me. And so I went out there and I start tearing this lawnmower apart, just, you know, there's a bolt, take that one out. Okay, yeah, the, you know, I don't know what, what I'm doing here, but I'm just doing it. And uh, all I could figure out was that for some reason, gas was leaking from the carburetor into the rest of the engine where gas was not supposed to be in that quantity at that time or whatever. And there's just gas everywhere. And uh, so I take the whole thing apart and get all the gas out and I put it all back together and I go to start it up, nothing happens. Well, that didn't work. So what do I do? I did the exact same thing over again. Took it all apart put it all back together, tried to start it up, nothing happens. So I walked away, I got frustrated. I said, you know what, I'm not doing this. The grass continues to grow. You know, it's gone from this high to this high now by this point, you know, it's, it's really needing mowed. And so a few days later, I go out there and I try to do it again. I try to fix it again, but I do the exact same thing over again. I go out there and I take it all apart and I put it all back together and I try to start it up, nothing happens. At this point, I'm frustrated. You know, I'm coming to the end of myself, and it's at this moment that I pray and I say, God, what do I need to do to get this lawnmower to be fixed? I'm not going to lie. I wasn't really expecting a response. You know, I didn't know God was into mechanics either. But this is what he said. I will never forget this. This blew my mind. He says, you need to drain the oil. There's gas in there. That's why it's not starting. God spoke that through the Holy Spirit to me in that moment. I'm like, what? So I'm like, oil, 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 pull it out. Sure enough, it's full of gas and oil at the same time, drained it all out, put it all back together, filled back up with oil and gas, boom, off it went. See, we need knowledge that we don't have. And the point of that is that why did I wait till the very end when I'm frustrated and throwing tools and the grass, you know, needs baled and swaths with a tractor before I finally get to the point where I'm like, God, you are so much smarter than I am. Why don't I just ask you first? Come on, think about how many times we've done that in our lives where we come to the end of ourselves and that's finally when we decide that maybe we should tap into the source of all knowledge and wisdom and grace and mercy. See, this is the point that, that, that I hope we understand today is that God is so extra in a good way. He has provided everything we need. Why do we try to do it in our own strength first and then go to God as a second uh, effort? Why do we try to do it in our own strength and then run to God at the very end when we've exhausted all of our efforts? The same thing is true with any of these things. I don't, I don't have time to go through the rest of the list, but he says, add to your, you know, your virtue knowledge and, and, and add this and add this and add this. And so you can take this same idea and put it on every single one of those things. We need this in our life. This is what we need. And God is the source of that need. So let's go to him 
to get it. So how do we do that? What does that look like? How do we begin to tap into the provision of God? How do we begin to tap into the abundance, the extravagance of God? And I wonder if it really is so simple is that we just need to ask. If we just need to come to the point where we say, God, this is what I need. I've identified it. I recognized it. Now, God, I'm asking you to supply it. I mean, what did James say back in James chapter four? He says, you have not because you ask not. He says, we don't have because we don't ask. We're trying to do it in our own strength. And God's sitting there. He's got all the stuff we need. He's already provided it for us. And we're trying to do it in our own strength. We're trying to do it in our own wisdom, in our own steadfastness, in our own intelligence, whatever it is. I wonder if maybe if we came to God with a humble heart, hungry for more of him and asked him if he wouldn't do what he's already promised he would do. I think I see that in Matthew chapter 7, and we'll wrap up with this today. This is talking about the character and the nature of God right here. And this is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? See, when we put this all together, God's desire, he says, I want to supply your needs. I've given you everything you need for life and godliness. Now just ask. And so I wonder today, as we evaluate this for ourselves, and we start to ask ourselves this question, what is it that I need? Some of us today, we might need some virtue. We might need to tap into God's source of virtue for our lives and say, God, there, there, there's things going on inside of me that I need your moral goodness to overcome. There might be knowledge things that we need. We might need knowledge to be able to uh, figure out the solution to a problem that we're facing. We, we might need some steadfastness because we feel like running. Somebody here today, you might need some brotherly affection because you have conflict with someone else. But this is the thing we have to remember. God is the source of all those things. So what do we need? What is it that we need in our lives? So I want to encourage you guys to stand to your feet this morning. And as we think about this, as we jump into this final worship song, and I told you guys earlier I would wrap back around to this idea. But I truly believe this with all my heart, that everything that I'm talking about kind of downstream from this one thing isn't going to mean anything unless we start at the point of faith. And so we might be here today and we recognize, man, I have got conflict. I, it's all about me. I've never, I've never identified this, but it's all about what I want. It's all about what I think. It's all about what I want to do. We, maybe we've come to that, that realization in this place today. And I just want to make an opportunity for you. I want to lead us in a prayer together as a group today, because I believe that the starting point of faith is the only way we're gonna experience this transition from just living for what we want to recognizing what we need. So I'm gonna ask you guys to bow your heads this morning with me and I'm gonna to lead us in this prayer. I want you guys to say this prayer with me. And if this is you, if you are genuinely, humbly saying this prayer to God this morning, then I would love for after service, if you would come and, and find myself or, or one of the staff here at Grace and just be able to express that. Say, hey man, I made a decision today that I'm gonna stop living for what I want and I'm gonna turn my life to Jesus and live for what I need. So I want you guys to pray this prayer with me today. Say, Heavenly Father, today I recognize that it's been all about me. 
It's been about what I want. It's been about what I think. It's been about what I want to do. But in this moment, I am choosing to turn my life towards you, to make you my Lord, my Savior, and my friend. So from here on out, it's not about me. It's all about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us. I hope that God spoke to you. We would love to follow up and care for you any way that we can. So come visit us at gracemontrose.org. Say hello. Let us know what we can do to help you grow in Him. God bless you.